I'm sitting here on a beach in Arishat, Cape Breton, Nova Scotia. Oh, it's about quarter of eight in the morning. I've been up for about oh, an hour now. It's an absolutely beautiful, just breathtaking morning. It's bright, it's clear, the sun's shining, little puffy white clouds overhead. It's quiet. I'm all by myself here on the beach. And this is a special beach for me. It's a special place for me. Uh, it's taken so long to, uh, to see Arishat, Cape Breton. I've heard about this, this town, this little French village since I was a small boy. Heard it from my father. Heard of Arishat countless times, many times, and also, of course, Jeff Thomas, Captain Jeff, who I was named after, my grandfather. This is the birthplace of Captain Jeff, and my God, I, there's a little small road here. And I'm sitting on the beach here with uh, rocks and seaweed all around me. But right on the road, there's a little shallow pond shining in the, sh shining in the sunlight this morning. That I could, uh, it's a stone throw, I could throw a rock. That's how close it is, and there's a, there's a foundation there. And there, there was a house there. It was torn down about a year or so ago. It, uh, it fell into disarray. Somebody tore it down. It was falling apart. But this, this was the birthplace of Jeff Thomas, my grandfather. It's taken me so long to get here. So many, uh, so many nights thinking about it and dreaming about it and wondering if I'd ever get to see Arishat. Well, I'm here with my father. And I just wish I could describe this, this view. It's, it's breathtaking. It's just so beautiful. The water is so blue. The sky is blue. The gentle wind blowing. The seagulls in the distance calling. It's quiet. It's peaceful. My God, I think I'm in heaven. It's so beautiful here. In a little while, we're going we're gonna to hear about uh, Captain Jeff Thomas from uh, Mr. Marshall Barano. Uh, who lives here in Arishad and has corresponded th with my father and myself here recently for uh, some some time. Marshall is my father's age and he's lived here all his life and he knows about the sinking of the Sylvania, my grandfather's schooner. And I'm sitting on this beach and of course I don't know the uh, the country here, I don't, I don't know the geography, but I'm looking out into a bay and supposedly uh, this was the, the bay that when Jeff Thomas was sunk by the uh, Germans uh, in the First World War, that he set, set out from the Sylvania with four other crewmen, and they rowed some 90 miles from where they were sunk across this bay and landed, if you can believe this, it's, it's a little... Uh, upsetting to talk about it I guess because it means so much to me but they landed on this beach so many years ago my grandfather and Captain Jeffrey Thomas and here I am years later sitting here looking out at it and my god I'm thrilled it's just so beautiful but we'll hear more about Jeff Thomas later on when we talk to Marshall Barano and the sinking of the Sylvania Captain Jeff Thomas. Uh, okay, we're going to start off. Uh, we're here in Marshall Barano's home in Arishat, Cape Britain, uh, Britain. And I'm sitting here at his kitchen table uh, in his lovely home with his wife, Ina, in the, in the living room. And my dad and I uh, and Marshall are going to talk a little bit briefly about the uh, sinking of the Sylvania. Uh, Dad, what year was that, uh, that mm. she was sunk? It was in uh, August 1918. August of 1918. Mm -hmm. But before we get into it, I just want to turn to Marshall Barano, and uh, he's going to just uh, introduce himself and just uh, uh, tell us how long he's lived in Cape Breton. Go ahead, Marshall. Well, now, uh, Chip, you did very well there in giving this broadcast, but you uh, trying to pronounce my name. You did a good job. Yeah. The right pronunciation of my name is Borino. Borino. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, we have lived here going on my 78th year. Seven. And I remember uh, your grandfather, uh, Captain Jeff Thomas. As a matter of fact, all the older people here in Irish would remember Jeff Thomas. And long before the 
so the sink in the Sylvania, he used to come into the port here off and on with many American vessels. And now, with the, as far as the sinking goes, I can recall vividly when I was a printer's devil on our little newspaper, the Richmond County Record, my, which my, oh, my father had established back in 1897. And uh, we remember when the Sylvania was uh, sank, uh, sank off of Cape Breton, about 90 miles off of Cape Breton. Now, no one got any news about the sinking in the Sylvania until Captain Jeff arrived in his own home port at Irish Head. And strange as it may seem, uh, the other crew members uh, landed in another part of Cape Breton down in Guyan Island. And I can remember when I worked in the Canadian Customs down around that part of the world, when I'd look out at Guyan Island, uh, right away would come to me, there's where some of the members of Jeff Thomas's vessel, the Sylvania, landed after she was torpedoed. Now, as you know, uh, Jeff came in, Captain Jeff came into Irish Hat and brought his vessel right below his old home at the uh, west end of Irish Hat Harbor, which is known as the Cove. And uh, at that time, there was a beautiful beach there, landed his dory on the beach, and I went to visit uh, the home, and he stayed there for the time he was here uh, at Ellie Thomas's. And uh, I think that your father would probably connect the relationship with the family much closer than I would. Mm -hmm. But how well I remember when Captain Jeff came to our print shop and my father was delighted to see him and your Uncle Bill, that's a brother of Jeff's, and how they related the story of the sinking of the Sylvania. I, at the time, was a printer's devil, and actually I was all ears listening. Uh, a printer's devil would be a, a young man that works yeah, an in apprentice, the... Uh, an apprentice. An apprentice. apprentice. Uh -huh. an apprentice. Uh -huh. And I, how, how well I remember this, and how proud we were to see Captain Jeff, oh, an immense man. And, well, you know, well, Marshall, I just want to in, uh, interrupt you for a second. I was just going to uh, uh, sort of lead, uh, lead in with a question. Uh, you know, did he appear to be a big man to you when you saw him? Uh, oh, yes, very big man. Mm -hmm. Oh, tremendous. And, uh, was he six feet? No, no, no. Five, five no, feet ten, no, wasn't he? Five foot ten. Yeah, eleven. but very broad. Yeah, broad. Yeah, very broad. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, Bill was a very big man, too. Yeah. And, Captain uh, Bill. The most uh, very delightful men to talk to, and my father was, oh, he was fascinated, and Dad took down some of the notes, and then mm -hmm. when the newspaper appeared uh, that week or the next week, he had an account of the sinking of the Sylvania firsthand. Mm -hmm. And uh, your father's uh, wonderful book, Fast and Able, mm -hmm. and he certainly describes the Sylvania and many more vessels in that book, but more particularly the Sylvania, because his father was the captain of the Sylvania, and I think possibly he was a part owner, was he not? Uh, yeah, owned half her at the time. Yes, and uh, you know, it must have been a sad thing when that vessel went down, and. All oh, you know, here's something, you know, I can see he was loaded with fish at the time, yeah, was he yeah, not, uh, yeah. Gordon, and lost all the cargo. Now, I just want to interrupt for a second, yeah. Marshall. Now, they came into your office. What was the reason for them coming in? Were they uh, uh, wiring home to Boston or something? No, or? they came into our office, I think, due to, he knew there was a little newspaper published here, mm -hmm. and I think that he was interested to give Dad the story, oh, I see. because I he see. belonged mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. and my father yeah, was a newspaper right. man, and yeah. he'd write I the see. story. Well, that's yeah. big news, Marshall. Yeah. That big news, but yeah, I right. hope to tell you it was now, Yeah, but listen, how did they get home from Arishat after they were sunk oh, to Boston? Oh, that, well, that, I think what happened, and I, I'm not sure, uh, uh, Jeff, but my uncle was friend, American consul in Hawkesbury, and I believe he came down here and got the boys uh, all settled mm -hmm. and ready to leave. Mm -hmm. And now, how they went, there was a boat service here. There was. Oh, yeah. oh yes, and the boat service would only go from here to the to uh, terminal at the CNR at Mulgrave. Mulgrave. And then they'd take the train there, mm -hmm. and from there, they go, go, they go home. Oh, see? I see. Yeah. That's how they got home. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, and, uh, yeah. Now, Dad, I just want to switch over to you for a minute. Yeah. <clears throat> because I want to ask you, uh, sort of specifically, about the sinking of the Sylvania. Mm -hmm. How did the Germans sink the schooners in those days? Obviously, they didn't. Obviously, that they didn't torpedo them. No, no, uh, they, they weren't. So, could you just talk a little bit about how the Triumph yeah. came up uh, yeah. upon her? 
Yeah, well, we were about 90 miles off the coast there. I guess according to what I could find out was the middle ground, they called That's it. Right. And uh, uh, they were there, for, there was a daybreak there. They were getting ready, the crew were all on deck, you know, getting ready to go, waiting up, getting ready to go, and uh, out on the trawls, and uh, they could see the steam trawl coming way off, and uh, they didn't pay much attention to it. And then a little later on, you know, uh, she's, they could see that she was approaching the uh, Sylvania. But they didn't think, still didn't think nothing of it. She, they, was, they, fly, they, she was flying what flag yet? Oh, no, she wasn't flying any flag, but she oh, knew no she flag. was a British. She, they, yeah. they know she was a Canadian sure. trawler. She was a prize and, ship. And she was, yeah. well, they didn't know that. Yeah, I don't, I don't know She that. was probably coming up to them uh, to speak, uh, you know, what they uh, find out how the fishing was and, and uh, so forth. And uh, uh, as I say, a little while later, the, uh, the crew still went on their business and uh, along came the steam trawler there. Well, the next thing, up uh, up goes the uh, the German flag. What swastika was yeah, it? No, yeah. no, no, no. They didn't no, use a swastika no, no, in those no, days. Not them days. These, are the, these weren't the Nazis. Yeah. They had the German naval flag. flag. And then, uh -huh. uh, uh, they, then they could see that up on the uh, the pilot house was a machine gun. Oh, God. You know, <laughs> they could notice that. That's all they had. They carried to a gun. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, 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 they came right alongside the Sylvania, and then the, the officer up on the bridge there uh, uh, with a megaphone uh, called over to the Sylvania and said, the, the captain. So my father went over the rail, and, and he says, the captain, he says, I want you to come aboard with uh, three or four of your men, he said, and uh, bring your papers and your flag. Now, what what uh, what German U-boat was this, Dad? Well, they didn't find that out till later on. Which the U what? U105. Yeah, U1, U1, U155. And what that. was the captain's name? But uh, well, wait a minute, I don't okay. explain oh, that. Right. And uh, uh, my father uh, came aboard because he knew then what was going on because they knew that they were sinking vessels along the yes. coast. They had heard, you know. So he got three of his men together and get the stuff together and they, they rode over to the, and boarded the, uh, the beam trawler. And on deck they were greeted by this officer, he's a young lieutenant. He uh, gave his name, he said, uh, uh, from the uh, uh, German U-boat, U-155, he says, Captain von, von Oldenburg of his Imperial, Imperial Majesty's Navy. And, uh, uh, he said, I'm sorry, uh, Captain, he said, uh, he shook hands with him, he said, I'm sorry, <laughs> Captain, but I'm going to sink you. And he says, uh, I'll give you uh, ten minutes, ten minutes, he said, to uh, get what you want to take. I'll give you a course, he says, and get away, because ten minutes, that's all. Mm -hmm. So uh, they rode back to the vessel, and the father gave the command, you know, to take what they, what they could get, you know, and get the dories out. So. Yeah. They rode off, and uh, rode off from the vessel. Meanwhile, the Germans uh, had landed uh, uh, several men aboard, and they uh, hung time bombs down in the hole. Yeah. And uh, they didn't torpedo any of the fishing schools, no. as some people believe. No. They didn't torpedo. They hung time bombs down. They didn't want to waste the torpedo. No. <laughs> and uh, uh, the crew away, they rode away towards the Nova Scotian coast, and a beautiful day. And the next thing, bango. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it blew the mouse right out of it. It did blow the mouse oh, yeah, out of it? Yeah, it blew all the pieces. And, and uh, well, that was it. She so then they, they hit it for the, uh, for the uh, Nova Scotian coast. But uh, as some people don't know, and, uh, the uh, my father's story had a, a, a never new motor on it. And uh, they were one of the crew, or well, his cousin. They were, pretty cousin. Brand, uh, they were pretty new in those days, yeah, weren't they? Yeah, they were experimenting, and yeah. they uh, carried it along. So my father said, all right, we'll, we'll use it. Yeah. So his dory uh, headed for uh, for his home, the birthplace of Arishat. Yeah. And uh, the other dories, uh, they were all out for themselves, and they landed on different points of the, uh, the Nova Scotian coast. Most of the other vessels that were sunk, uh, like the eight Pied Andrew, Captain Wallace Bruce, and the Francis J. O'Hara, Captain Joseph Mosquito, they were all in the vicinity, they, they were sunk too. They, most of their crews and some Canadian vessels landed in Kenso. Because I was told uh, uh, not too long ago by an old timer in Gloucester that came from Kenso. Uh, he was a little young kid at the time and he said that uh, Kenso was loaded with fishermen from the sunken vessels. Uh, just filled up with them. And, uh, 
But my father landed in the, at his home birthplace of Evershot. I, I don't know why he hid it there, but probably he he had that feeling he wanted to, and he had the engine on him. He had the advantage on the dory, and uh, that's where they came. They landed on the beach down just in front of his home. Now, what about the German U-boat commander? There's something interesting about and that. And the U-boat commander there, that, that particular U-boat, the U-155, those, those, those are all five U-boats that came over in that raid were, were giants at the time. They were called them cruisers. Yeah, how long were they? Do you remember? Three hundred feet? Oh, long? They, oh they, uh, no, they were two hundred. Two hundred, you know, yeah. yeah. And but they were they were big boats compared mm -hmm. to the others, and yeah. and they carried a big crew, big gun on deck. But uh, uh, the five did uh, quite a bit of damage, but it was more or less of a scare to scare the American people. And uh, the all the five at the end of the summer, the five uh, uh, were called back home. And uh, I think this schooner John J. Flaherty had a Gloucester saw fisherman, big big vessel, uh, was sunk on Grand Bank. I think she was the last one sunk by the U-155. And uh, uh, then they were they were called home, and the five returned, and all five approaching the European coast there. But the uh, the U-155 didn't make it. She struck a mine in the English Channel, going under, and uh, that was the last I ever heard of it. She was the only one that never returned. Lost with all hands. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She was lost with all hands. And the other four returned to their base at Kiel. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it was a it was a scare raid more or less. Uh, did they did they sink any fishermen with any loss of life? No. No, I didn't no, think so. No, they never took a life. Not a fisherman. Yeah. No, they never took a loss of life. They didn't shell the vessels. Yeah. They were very courteous. Mm -hmm. And uh, in other words, they acted like human beings. Should act. Yes, that's correct. The Nazis in World War II, uh, they raided because the wolf packs were everywhere. They did a lot of damage in the West Indies and everything, and they raided the fishing. Oh, they trashed that at all, and they sunk two or three vessels. That's all, draggers. Yeah. And they shelled them. They, they did. hit the, yeah, one bean troll out of Boston. They sunk her. They shelled her and killed two or three men, and uh, uh, they shelled them. And uh, they, uh, they were a different bunch. The Nazis in the, in the, in the World War One, but uh, it wasn't much of a raid on the fishermen. Not World War, not like that, because the, uh, uh, there was quite a few vessels, huh? Oh, yes. And uh, Canadian and, and American vessels. And uh, one of the U-boats, not the U-155, there made a raid on the sword fishing fleet uh, on an Nantucket Sound and sunk the little vessels, 50, 60 foot long, and they sunk several of them in one raid, but. Uh, it, uh, it was more or less of a scare and cripple the, uh, the economy, you know, but it didn't amount to much. Okay. Um, Marshall, uh, when you saw Jeff Thomas that time he came into the uh, store, uh, into your uh, uh, huh. shop, now that's the last time you ever saw him again. I never saw him after. You never saw him after? No. Well, because I never saw my grandfather. Uh, he, <laughs> he died, uh, what, two years before I was born? Was it 34, 1934? No, you, I was married in 1934. Yeah. You were born in 1936. He yeah. died in 1930. He died in March. March. 1934. I was married in July. Yeah, he was uh, 59 when he died? He died 59. Chip and ice out at sea on the adventure. Yeah, exactly. And his body was landed in uh, Halifax. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they packed him in ice and then landed him in Halifax. Yeah, Dad, there's been a lot of stories uh, I've heard over the years about his strength. Uh, was he a pretty strong man? Oh, God, yes. Yes, you are. Yeah, well, he was. was there a story concerning the main boom one yeah, time? With no, there was a story there concerning the four boom. Four which boom. Which is much shorter, of course. Yeah. And uh, fishermen told me that, and two, two different ones that had sailed with my father. They said, tell him about how strong he was, you know. And, and uh, as I say, he's a very quiet man aboard the vessel. He held off to himself a lot. Moody, very yeah. moody. And uh, he uh, uh, they'd said this particular time on deck there, they crew was struggling there, several of the men were struggling to get the four boom, you know, in, and they couldn't, they were all on it, you know, my father... How much would that four boom he, weigh, you got any oh, idea? No, I had A couple hundred idea, pounds, no, or three hundred? No, it was boom. about what, the four boom would be what, about 25 feet? Oh, yes. I'd say 24, 25 feet long. Yes. I wouldn't know what it weighed, but of course it wasn't like the main boom was 75 foot, oh, yeah. you know, but uh, uh, they were struggling to the four boom to get her in, to pull her in, you know, to change it. Change the course, you know, and uh, the father of Jesus, he, he got mad and 
And they said the next thing you know, he swept them all out the way and he grabbed that boom and Jesus, he pulled it right. <laughs> That he had two great big hands on him, great big like big hands. Hands like hams. Yeah, yeah. big hams, and and uh, and they were uh, just as hard. Well, that's that's I think that's due from the the hand on the ropes and the salt, yeah. the salt. His hands must have been like leather for crying yeah, out loud. Yeah, yeah, they were they were very very big hands. Christ, he made two out of my hands. Yeah, and uh, he's a very strong man. For now to see him, he'd be he, he looked like a, a, a you'd say a, a fat man, a stout yeah. man. Yeah, but uh, he was strong as an ox. Now, uh, he was a hard drinker, wasn't he, Jeff? Uh, well, he was a drinker this way, like a lot of them, yeah. when he was ashore. Uh -huh. Now, i tell you an interesting thing about my father. He, <coughs> they say he could handle, hold his liquor better than any, any, any person in Gloucester. Is that right? Now, he could get up in the morning, what he used to do in the morning, he'd get up and cook himself a big bread. He never asked my mother to do anything. Uh -huh. He'd get up himself. He used to get up early, because I suppose he used to aboard the vessel, and he'd cook himself a big meal, a steak, uh, several eggs, home fries and everything. And the mom, that right? See, he'd put that under his belt, and and uh, down the street he'd go. Well, he'd meet the skippers. You, you, the, the skippers are kind of a club. They all knew each other, Wallace, Bruce, and Archie McLeod, and all, and Morrissey, and them guys. And they'd go. They'd make the rounds all day long. Well, he'd come home probably at supper time or in the evening, and he'd come up Washington Square where we lived, and he'd walk a straight line. Mm. And they said the the liquor that he had put away during that day, because he drank all good stuff, you know. Oh yes. And uh, he could hold it. Mm. There's only one night that I I can ever remember, and that was a snowstorm was yeah. blowing heavy, and my mother's sitting in the window waiting for him. She says, "I wish your father would come home." For God's sake, she said, "The damn thing gets some sense in his head." Snowing like the devil. And <laughs> you see him coming around the corner. Yeah. Now, Washington's kind of a long street. <clears throat> Next thing you know, my father's gone. See, I said, you know, where we went? Oh, no, no, he didn't show up. <laughs> Jesus, I, he said, she said, well, you better get down and look. Let's see where we went. And <laughs> see if he's in some doorway. We went down there, he's his feet sticking out of a snowbank. <laughs> oh, jeez. Well, he didn't make it that night. <laughs> but outside of that, he very when he when he was to, uh, he never abused anybody. Very uh, very jolly when he gets uh, a few under his belt. Mm -hmm. Very jolly, and very generous. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, here's a dollar for you. Or here's a couple yeah. of dollars for yeah. you. See? How about that? When he was sober, well, you'd have to coax him. <laughs> see. But uh, very, yeah. very, very jolly, very humorous when he was drinking. Yeah, Aunt Natalie told me a couple of weeks ago, sitting on the front porch at Long Beach, that uh, when he would, was drinking like that, when he came home, it was easy for her to get money out of him. Yeah, that he used yeah, to give, yeah. give her money for you and her. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But he, uh, mm -hmm. he never abused the family. He never put a hand on one of us. Mm -hmm. Never remember putting his hand on one of us. And as I say, he, uh, he, uh, he wasn't abusive, but he, he could hold his liquor back. When he went out to sea, that was the end of it. Yeah, well, yeah, that that's was the end of the drinking. Yeah. See, that was the end. But they then most of all them fellas were like that. There was a few that didn't drink, but mm -hmm. damn few. Yeah. And but they were happy-go-lucky, and uh, they were a great, uh, wonderful, wonderful breed of men. Mm -hmm. they were. Believe me, wonderful breed of men. Yeah. That uh, I guess they tell me I've talked with fishermen there. They tell me that. Some year, years ago, they ever they put in the shell, but the vessels used to put in shelving a lot. They'd anchor out there and off of Sandy Point, and go ashore. Well, when they, the people ashore knew that the American vessels were coming in, they uh, uh, organize a dance at the at the hall there or something. Well, I guess there was many of the set to in the hall there. They get yeah. drinking, oh, yeah. but that, that was it. You know yeah. what I mean? They, yeah. they were just a happy. Yeah. Happy, good, 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 you know, and the good-natured men, rugged men. By God, they, they were, and they took great pride in their vessels. Oh, their vessels are everything, you know. They boast about how this one could beat this one and that one and everything. My father's, uh, my father's favorite was a Sylvania. He liked that vessel. She's good all-around vessel. She's a fast sailor, and a good money maker, and a good comfortable vessel. Now later on, when, of course, when he lost her, it was quite a blow. She was partially insured, and it was quite some, <coughs> quite some years later than the, uh, they uh, got the settlement from the German government. They got a settlement from the German oh, yeah. government? Oh, yeah. yeah. I didn't know oh, that. Oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, hmm. 
uh, didn't cover, cover quite the loss, but uh, they were lucky to get it, I suppose. But uh, he always said that uh, the Puritan now that came later in 1922, because she's built the race of Blue Nose. The flying fool. Yeah, and she was an yeah. exceptionally fast vessel, probably the fastest one ever sailed out of Gloucester. But she was crazy. And he said that. He said, I God, she'd beat anything, he said, but you can't, can't hold a damn thing. Uh, he said, and uh, uh, he didn't like her as a vessel. Uh -huh. See, he said she'd be no good later on in fishing because that, that type of vessels are built, like the Gertrude Tebow and the Columbia and the Puritan and them. See, they, they weren't good fishermen because they uh, they could run down on the dories too fast, picking up their dories. You know, they go, they're fast vessels. Mm -hmm. See, the way they were built. And uh, they, they weren't good fishermen. And uh, there's none of them made any money. Well, the no. Puritan, she was so fast, she overshot a course yeah, by how many miles? Yeah, she overshot a course 20 odd miles. And, and hit where? Yeah. Was it Sable Island? Sable Island. In the fog. Graveyard of the Atlantic. Fog and, and a good breeze blowing there. And he uh, he was on deck there. And uh, he told the, uh, the man at the wheel there, he says, I'm going to blow for a few minutes. He says, there are about 20, uh, 20 miles this side of the island, according to my reckoning. And it's, uh, he didn't reckon she was going that fast. How about, was she doing 13, oh, 14 knots? She was, no, she was probably doing uh, probably 10, 10, 12 knots in the yeah. fog. That's yeah. very, you know, she's moving right along. Yeah. And uh, he says, uh, uh, call me if you need me. And he, he started to go down the companionway steps, and he no sooner put his feet on the cabin floor and bang on. Now, was this Jeff? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sable Island, yeah. She was right, she had struck the northwest bar. Tore the bottom Yeah, up. right, tore the bottom right out of it. Oh, yeah. Then she heeled over, and the mast started to come out. Oh, jeez. And the big seas are going up over, see? Yeah. Uh, that's a, on that bar, you know. Yeah. And uh, they had a struggle. To get off. Trying to get the dory through, because they were smashing up fast. Wow. They, that's they then, you know. But he them. did, he got them all up. And yeah. my, he was in the water up to his neck. He was? Yeah, and uh, it's a way of swept him away, but my uncle, my uncle Peter, one of the crew, uh, saved him. He uh, he got a hold of him. He did? And they got the dory loose, one of the dories loose, you know, and uh, several of the dories loose, and uh, and uh, he, he got my father. He's, he really saved my father. They hmm. lost one man, they were fortunate. Well, they lost one man? Yeah. What's his name, uh, do you know? Yeah, Chris Johnson. He was a, a fellow that they never, he just signed on that trip. Yeah. No one seemed to know him. Uh-huh. You know, he's just a stranger come into town. Mm -hmm. I guess he's just meant to die, I guess. Yeah. And anyhow, uh, well, most all the dories headed out uh, for the Nova Scotian coast. Uh-huh. Well, you know, and my father decided to land on the island. Oh, God. And he did. His dory landed on the island. Sable Island. Well, Peter was with him. Rough place. And, uh, uh, I think Delory was one of them that hit it for the Nova Scotian crew. I think Tom was in the Puritan crew. Now, I wouldn't swear to He was in the Sylvania crew. Well, well how long were they on years. Sable Island and how'd they get off? Oh, he's on the island there four or five days before they could get him off. Who the got American him off? government sent the Tampa down there. Uh, the Coast Guard cut a Tampa. Oh, Coast Guard cut a Tampa. Yeah, and she lay off the island. See, see there's no harm. Can't get in there, no, I know it. No. And know certain, it. certain uh, <coughs> ways of the wind and everything you can land on that island, see. And she was off there five or six days before they got him off, and they brought him home. Yeah. But uh, the vessel was nothing left of but kindling wood. Kindling wood. Well, Marshall, um, is there <coughs> anything you want to add about Jeff Thomas and passing? Uh, I think yeah, we've had a good talk about Captain Jeff. That was very good. There's one thing there in particular I'd like to talk to you about, and that's the Triumph. Triumph, yeah. yeah. The Triumph was a trawler that sailed out of Hawkesbury for the uh, Leonard Fisheries. Now, it's strange to me seeing the engineer of the Triumph was taken by the Germans. He was taken? Yeah, he was taken on board as the uh -oh. engineer because mm -hmm. she was a steam a steamboat. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. And I never heard, I've been trying to find out since, what happened to ca the engineer of the Triumph. Yeah. But uh, the, the owners of the Triumph were the Leonard's, and I've often spoke to George Leonard, and George Leonard told me all about it, and I think he must have a, a, a yeah, photo that's inter of interesting. the Triumph. Interesting. They probably uh, you don't have a photo of the Triumph. No, never no. had. Never you had know, a, I don't know, we, I I don't know whether we mentioned this to you, Marshall. We probably didn't. I don't know. But hopefully he's going to write a story of, uh, of the right. in, the, in the Gloucester magazine. It's a beautiful magazine. Yes. I'll send it to you of this German boat raid and uh, this whole thing came, he's always wanted to write the story for the for somebody but 
The whole thing came up about two years ago. There's a young reporter in Gloucester. I think his name was Nick Mencher. And he wrote this story about the just very a, just an outline. Just an outline. It wasn't a lot of facts and figures, but he said one thing in the article, and I said to my dad, I said, uh, Dad, you better see what he wrote here. He's telling about Captain Jeff and the Sylvania and so on. Captain Mosquito, yeah. And so on. And he said, uh, uh, Jeff Thomas uh, was another fool that day. Use oh, yes, the word yeah, fool. Made a fool of. Uh, he was made a fool of. I said, Dad, you better read. I would, we would like to send greetings to the uh, good people of Shelburne, Nova Scotia, and we would like to send uh, our congratulations uh, to the town folk of Shelburne celebrating their 200th bicentennial, Shelburne, Nova Scotia, 1983. And uh, what I'm going to be doing, my first I'd like to identify myself. My name is Jeffrey Thomas. I am the son of Arthur and schooner historian Gordon W. Thomas, formerly of Gloucester, Mass. Uh, he's 75 years old, has written two books, Fast and Able, Life Histories of Famous Gloucester Fishing Vessels, uh, now in its fourth printing, I may add, uh, who has conducted some 59, 60 years of research, researching the Gloucester schooner, and is the foremost historian concerning the Gloucester schooner and the men who sailed them, the Gloucestermen. Uh, second book, Wharf and Fleet, uh, is a couple of years old. Uh, uh, both of these books, by the way, I believe may be in the Shelburne Historical Association, a society. And what we're going to do now, I'm interviewing Gordon W. Thomas uh, on his remembrances of the uh, schooners in the early 1900s that were that were put into Shelburne, Nova Scotia uh, for various reasons and of course uh, the Gloucestermen was primarily made up of uh, uh, of maritimers, uh, men that were born in uh, Nova Scotia and Newfoundland but we're going to be talking to Gordon Thomas uh, and we're going to be interviewing him concerning uh, the Gloucester schooner putting into Shelburne, Nova Scotia. Dad? Well, I've always had a great regard for Shelburne, Nova Scotia. Uh, ever since I was old enough to remember. Uh, it seems so that, of course, as you said, Jeff, that most of the uh, the crewmen of the Gloucester vessels and Boston vessels uh, came from the, from the Maritimes and Shelburne, and Shelburne County, sent a great, great many of them. Some of the finest fishermen out of Gloucester uh, from Shelburne County. And uh, Shelburne stands out in my mind more than uh, any other port in the Maritimes. And I, I've uh, only been there twice in 1980, 1981. Uh, it was the first times I ever uh, went down all through the uh, Nova Scotia, uh, the different ports that sent men to Gloucester. But uh, 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 Shelburne uh, just sticks out at uh, uh, Liverpool and Lockport, of course, and Canso sent men, Pubnicos and Argyle and, and Woods Harbor, Clark's Harbor, gosh, it all along the Cape Britain area, Sharton. Sydney, Nova Scotia, God's sake, that's, uh, uh, they all sent their men to Gloucester, and those ports are very familiar to me through my writing, uh, although not uh, having traveled down there until recently, I, uh, I became very familiar with them, and, and hearing about them through different men through the years, different fishermen of the different ports, and I, I became very familiar with them. It seems so I'd been there years and years ago, and uh, which I hadn't, And uh, but Shelburne always stood out in my mind. But, uh, and of course, I think mostly through that is that uh, we had a lifelong, I had a lifelong friend, uh, Charlie Downey, who was a fisherman out of Gloucester for many years, came in the 1890s, and 
and uh, to Gloucester to fish as a young boy. And, Sandy Point. And he came from Jordan Ferry, okay. Shelburne County, and that's where the Firths and the Downies came from. And uh, uh, of course, through the years and my contact with him, and even after he, he retired from the sea and moved up with his sister in Raymond, New Hampshire on a farm and spent the rest of his days up there. Uh, we used to visit him very often. I, my family growing up, I'd bring with me and, and uh, I always asked, I was asking him questions, questions, questions. And uh, he answered me the best he could. And of course I heard so much about Shelburne and Shelburne County and the men from there and, and different times while I was there. Uh, while we were there, I, uh, uh, there'd be old timers would drop in. Retired a fisherman that knew Charlie and would drop in and, and pay a visit uh, while we were there. Uh, I know uh, the, the Masons from up Chester Way, uh, Billy and, and, uh, and Tom, and uh, were old jury mates of Charlie's, and Bob Dahl, he was from Shelburne County, and, and uh, 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 Cliff Fay. Another Shelburne man, and, uh, and then of course my old friend Wiley Rudolph from Canso, uh, uh, he made several trips up to see Tabby, and we called him Tabby uh, ever since we were kids, and uh, uh, to see Charlie, and uh, he, uh, we had uh, many talks about the vessels and things, and that Shelburne just grew on me, and uh, so uh, that's what I wanted to do before I passed on. In this world, I wanted to visit those ports that sent the men to Gloucester. And in 1980, in the September, Jeff and I uh, uh, sailed across in the ferry Blue Nose, and we went down as far as Halifax. And well, we ran out of time and finances, and we we did take in the Lunenburg Sea Fair and and followed along the coast, and and we uh, we stopped. At and in fact, uh, we, we stopped at Shelburne on the, on the way home, and uh, this was in 1980. And uh, uh, we met, uh, we were fortunate, uh, and uh, through advance notices that we were coming, that uh, we met a very, very gracious couple, hmm. uh, Jack, uh, Jack and Nettie Conrad, uh, of the Cape, uh, of the Shelburne Historical Society. And, and they took us under their wing, and and uh, we were fortunate that they they showed us places in Shelburne and introduced us to people. Showed us hospitality, mostly. And the hospitality that they showed us, and, and it was it was wonderful. That uh, uh, we were very fortunate, and I was very pleased with Shelburne. I wasn't disappointed. Uh, the harbor, of course, I knew the harbor was was. Uh, uh, one of the, uh, well, considered one of the best in the world, and uh, I don't know how many miles long it is, some say 12, 16, I don't know just how much, but I know it's a long one, and uh, uh, the fishermen tell me that it's, uh, the water is deep in Shelburne Harbor, deep right in close to the shores, and uh, uh, I, uh, as, I, as I say, I always, uh, I always wanted to see Shelburne more than any other place, and believe me, I was never, I was not disappointed with it. Uh, uh, and of course, it did help so much by the Conrads being so nice to us and taking us places. And of course, in 19. Stop. 